Hello everybody, uh, this is Brother Luke, a Sin City Preacher. I believe that the title of this video will be Unadulterated Grace, the Real Gospel. I know that uh, we don't like to really get our definitions of theological logical terms from uh, the modern dictionaries, but it may be helpful just to see what these words mean here. Uh, just in the in general, what does the word grace mean? The the dictionary definition is a disposition to be generous or helpful, goodwill. So it's having the disposition that you're generous and showing goodwill. So God has this disp disposition of generosity and goodwill, graciousness. It also says, grace means mercy or clemency. It says, a favor rendered by one who need not do so. Indulgence. So, you've heard the, the common saying that uh, grace is unmerited favor. Uh, and so, this dictionary definition agrees with that. It says, it's favor uh, rendered by one who need not do so. God does not need to show us favor. He's not required to be gracious. He simply is gracious. And then the last part of this definition says, divine love and protection bestowed freely on people. So the, the grace of God is this divine love that uh, God offers all people. Uh, he doesn't have to do it. He's not obligated to do it. It's simply because he's gracious. Uh, he, uh, he's generous. He's full of goodwill and mercy and kindness and love and he wants to give us a favor that he's not required to give us and we certainly don't deserve it. That's grace. And the favor that he wants to give us is uh, eternal life uh, in the kingdom of God and with no no uh, worry f about the payment of sins. So now let's look at the word adulterated. It says to make impure by adding extraneous improper or inferior ingredients. I remember years ago talking to a friend of mine. Uh, he, he surprised me that he said that uh, the commandment, uh, thou shalt not commit adultery, he didn't believe that it was talking about uh, a sexual act uh, where a spouse uh, has sex with someone outside of their marriage. Uh, he thought this adultery was uh, referring to um, making the, the Jewish uh, race of people, the, the genealogy of the Jews, uh, to be impure, uh, watered down uh, by mixing with the other cultures and communities, mixing ethnically uh, and also possibly bringing in other religions that would affect uh, Judaism. So I, I do think that uh, uh, that is a, a, a proper definition of, of a, adultery in, in that sense. I don't believe that the, the commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery, is, is referring to that. But I, I think that uh, if the Jews were to mix with other races of people, it would be a, an expression of a, a form of adultery. Uh, bringing in things that uh, cause this race of the, the Jewish people and their Judaism to become impure. Uh, so, how does adultery or adulterated and grace go, go together the way that uh, I want you to understand? Well, we need to look at Romans 11, verse 6. In the Amplified Version, it says, talking about salvation. 
But if it is by grace, that is, his unmerited favor and graciousness, then it is no longer conditioned on works or anything men have done. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. It would be meaningless. So, Paul's talking about here about uh, adulterated grace. If you try to mix anything in with grace, then it can no longer be even be considered grace. It's, it's, it's not pure grace, and therefore it's no longer grace at all. So, if, if someone thinks that we're saved by grace, the grace of God, and then they also say that um, man has to contribute something to this, uh, then, then we're adding man's performance, and therefore it's no longer grace at all. This is the point Paul is making in that verse there, that... Uh, if, if we're saved by grace, it's got to be entirely by grace. You can put, put no faith in your works, in your religiosity, uh, in your personal merit. That has, should not factor in at all. So now, let's talk about the gospel. Uh, the, the gospel, of course, is, is a Greek word that means the good, good news. Now, to me, the, the gospel is, uh, can be very broad. It can be a, a lot of information that I could share that would be good news. And for example, that uh, uh, God loves mankind so much that he, he wanted mankind to be saved. He knew that mankind could not save himself. And so he decided that he would become a man for the salvation of mankind. By becoming a man, he could pay for man's sin. And then they would be able to receive eternal life through faith in him. So that's kind of a broader sense, uh, description of, of the good news. But uh, people want, if you want to narrow it down and, and condense it even further, uh, we know that there is a verse that says, the, the, the gospel is that Christ died for our sins, he was buried, and rose from the dead on the third day. So, in this, in this statement, he died for our sins, was buried, and rose from the dead, the first statement of it is so critically important to understand, he died for our sins. That's the cross. He died on the cross, and paid for our sins. Uh, the scripture says that, uh, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So the important thing to understand about the cross is that uh, when Jesus said, it is finished, it's a declaration and it's, it's uh, if it is finished, if the, if the payment for mankind's sins has been completed, then we should understand that our sins are forgiven. All of our sins, the sins of all mankind, for all those who believe in Jesus and even for those people who do not believe in Jesus, for the people who lived in the past, the present, and the future. The, for the sins committed in the past, the present, and the future, they're all forgiven. They will all put on Jesus Christ on that cross. He paid for the sins of the whole world. So what we've got to understand from the cross is our sins are forgiven. Now, if you can accept that fact, which is the most important fact you must comprehend, then you should also understand that you don't need to be concerned about trying to satisfy God in, in any way because God is already satisfied. He's satisfied because he accepted what Jesus Christ did on our behalf. He died for our sins, therefore our sins are forgiven. 
It's not up to you or me or any person to take it any further and, and say, well, now I have to repent of my sins. I have to be sorry for my sins. No, your sins are forgiven. Well, what about uh, in the future? Don't, don't I have to uh, like change my life around and try to please God and, and uh, surrender my life and be a servant? Well, you're, you're welcome to do that. That, that, may be, that may be very beneficial, but do not believe that that is a requirement that God is imposing on you. If you, if you believe that, then you cannot believe your sins have already been forgiven. So this is one of the biggest problems I see in all of Christendom. I think that probably 90, maybe as much as 99% of all Christendom, all of the people in the world who label themselves as Christian in some form, probably 99% of them do not understand that their sins have already been forgiven and sin is no longer an issue between man and God anymore. If they did understand that, they would not be spoiling this message, this good news, when they tell someone about how to get saved by adding things that are are already settled, like repenting of your sins, changing your life, surrendering your life, following Jesus, serving Jesus, whatever it is, however they want to express it. Make Jesus your Lord. Well, they do not understand this most basic principle that all of mankind's sins are already forgiven. Now, for those of you who can understand that and accept that, then stand up right now and shout, Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Thank you, Jesus! My sins are forgiven. If the, if the light, if you've seen the light and now you understand your sins are forgiven, now you're prepared for the next thing. Knowing that your sins are forgiven, knowing that you have access to God, sin was a barrier between man and God. Now, Jesus removed the barrier. You're welcome to come to God and become his child, be adopted into this family, this, this kingdom of God, this, be born again as a child of God. You're welcome to do that now. Sin will not hold you back because all the sins are forgiven. So now the question is life, life everlasting. So when the gospel says, Christ died for our sins, he was buried, and he rose from the dead on the third day. This resurrection tells us that Jesus Christ has the power over life and death. He has the power to give you life everlasting. He proved it by raising himself from the dead. So now that you understand that sin is not an issue because, hallelujah, our sins are all forgiven, and now that you understand that you, you have access to God, then all you need to do is come to Jesus Christ and receive this life everlasting. You see, if, if you haven't received this life everlasting from Jesus, then uh, you don't have life. You have death. Every one of us who have been born after Adam and Eve have been born dead spiritually. All, all the spirits of all mankind are dead. We need our spirits to be brought back to life. The Bible says they will be quickened, uh, regenerated, brought back to life. We need, we need to be born again spiritually. We need to have Jesus Christ put his Holy Spirit into us, quickening us, bringing our spirit to life, to life everlasting. Now, what do you have to do for, to, to receive this life everlasting? 
Well, it has nothing to do with sin because Jesus already paid for your sins. Your sins are all forgiven. All you have to do is believe that Jesus does have the power to give you life everlasting and believe that he will give it to you. Once you believe in him for life everlasting, that's when he puts his Holy Spirit into you and you become brought to life, born again as a new creature, as a child of God. So within this statement, Christ died for our sins. He was buried and he rose from the dead on the third day. We have the, the death for our sins. That tells us that the sin issue is resolved. Our sins are all forgiven. He rose from the dead tells us that he does have the power of life. Right now, you're dead spiritually. If you want your spirit to be brought to life and have life everlasting and be a child of God and be promised eternal life in the kingdom of God, Jesus is reaching out to you right now and offering you this life everlasting. The Bible says it's a free gift. It's free. That means that you don't have to do anything for it. It's a gift. In fact, it says you cannot work for it, you cannot earn it, you cannot buy it. Jesus did all the work for you, and he paid for it for you. And now, he's got it all wrapped up with a nice bow on it, and he's offering it to you. Do you want it? If you want it, put your faith in Jesus Christ completely. Reject the idea that you have a part to play in your salvation. Jesus did it all. He paid for all our sins, and when he was dying on the cross, he declared, it is finished. The sins are forgiven. So be joyful. I know your sins are forgiven. It's no longer an issue between you and God, now or in the future. And now, come to Jesus to receive the gift of eternal life. I, I watch a lot of videos on YouTube. And I, I know that a lot of Bible teachers in YouTube have a lot of good things to teach. And over and over again, I find that I'm really benefiting from someone's teaching until they commit adultery, until they make this pure grace adulterated. They've spoiled it because they add something that's not a requirement. And then grace is no more grace. So uh, it's sad that I can find so few Bible teachers that understand unadulterated grace, the real gospel. But over and over again, I'll be listening to someone and enjoying their teachings, and they have some great insights, and then they start talking about repenting of our sins, surrendering our lives, picking up our cross, following him, serving him, surrendering. And what they've done is committed adultery. Well, now you know the truth, the real gospel. Your sins are forgiven. You can receive life everlasting from Jesus Christ. Just put your faith completely in him. Don't put your faith in yourself. If you do this, please make a comment on this video. And henceforth, rest in the love and grace of Jesus Christ.